Hi, let's take a look at the historic churches of Romney Marsh. This is the first of a two-part series. Our journey will take us through a corner of the county of Kent and dip our toes into East Sussex too. This is a circular route of under 50 miles or 80 kilometres. We'll start at Junction 11 of the M20 motorway, where you'll find a Shell petrol station and an Ionity charging point. If you want to cycle the route, the railway station will be Western Hangar, close by. We'll cover seven churches in this part, and seven in part two. So without further ado, let's get started. You may have caught our other Romney Marsh road trips. If not, I'll pop them up at the end. We will intersect those routes in places, but this journey is about the 14 historic churches and the story it tells about life in this little part of the world. As with all my videos, the places and any links I mention will be featured in the description below. I will also give you the church postcode and the what three words identifier to provide you with a more precise location to help you find these little gems. I have also created a Google map for you to download the route, which is of course in the description too. If the landscape of Romney Marsh interests you, then I recommend the Ordnance Survey app. With the premium version, you can access OS Explorer and Land Ranger maps, which opens up the UK public rights of way. It also offers so much more. If you're interested in exploring the UK, I suggest you check it out. Anyway, our first church. All Saints in the village of Burmash has just popped into view. Time to find somewhere to park and explore a little more. All Saints was built in the mid 12th century and is quite a small church and consists of a chancel, a nave and a tower. The tower and nave were replaced during the 14th century due to weakening. We arrived on this Wednesday morning at a little after 10, just as the church warden was opening up, so we ventured inside, through the 16th century archway, noting the little details as we went. Inside it still has a Norman feel, with a hint of Victorian, as a result of the restoration of 1876. The wooden screen was erected in 1923 for two village men who fell in the First World War. In the corner you'll find the 15th century tenor bell. It was replaced as it had cracked, but there are still two 14th century bells in the peel. And now to step outside. And if you know anything about Janice, you know she can't resist a graveyard or a cemetery. However, we have plenty more churches to see, so we need to make our way to our next destination, Dimchurch. And as we head across the Romney Marshes, I'll just mention how we got to our list of 14 churches. Well, we didn't. There is an organisation, the Romney Marsh Historic Churches Trust, founded in 1982 to preserve these ancient places of worship and the land they sit on. You can find more information on their projects and works undertaken on their site. Link in the description below. And talking of reference materials, I have a couple of books on my bookshelves that I often reach for. The first is I Never Knew That About Coastal England. Chapter 13 covers the Kent coast from the Romney Marshes to the Isle of Sheppey and features many of the churches we'll visit, along with more details on the history of this part of the coastline. I really enjoyed Christopher's I Never Knew That About series of titles, and I have plenty that are well thumbed as I return to them time and time again. I'll pop an Amazon.co.uk link in the description so you can find out more details. The second book... Oh, hang on. We're almost at our next destination. I'll get to that book in a moment. We're just joining the Hyde Road, and a word of warning. It can be busy during the summer holiday season, especially at weekends. Dimchurch is a popular little seaside town with a hint of retro about it, but it's a great place for the family to escape to. I spy a church on our right, before we hit the centre of town. This must be St Peter and St Paul's. We just need to find somewhere to park. St Peter and St Paul's is another Norman church, built in the mid 12th century, constructed of local Kentish flagstone and stone from the Norman city of Caen. 
As you step into the church, through its 13th century porch, you should notice the chancel arch, an original feature made of carved stone. The church was enlarged in 1821 and the width increased by 4 metres. Additionally, a gallery was added for further seating. The church organ was installed in 1923. It's from the gallery you get the best views of the church below and that chancel arch. Dean Church is home to the fictional 18th century rector come smuggler Dr. Sin, created by the English actor and writer Russell Thorndike. He may not be as famous as his oldest sister Sybil Thorndike, who is buried at Westminster Abbey. Russell is closer. He was laid to rest in St. Peter and St. Paul's churchyard. We are now heading to church number three, be heading inland slightly, but not before we pass through the heart of Jim Church. Now I'm going to speed up the action. If you want to know more about the town and have a proper look around, then don't forget to check out part one of our Romney Marsh tour at the end. Now that second book I was referring to earlier, well that's Kent's Strangest Tales. Curious little book has over 70 little stories with titles as intriguing as The Ramsgate Madman Who Designed Big Ben, Where the USA Began, Van Gogh, Maths Teacher, to name but a few. It also contains Kent's Most Useful Vicar about a meeting at St Peter and St Paul's in Dimchurch and the river that left Kent overnight in 1287. This gives a glimpse into one moment in Romney Marsh's history. All the tales are pretty short and well worth taking a peek at if you're interested in Kent history. As always, link below. We're now arriving at the hamlet of St Mary in the Marsh and the church of St Mary the Virgin. We just need to find somewhere to park. Now, this is St Mary the Virgin and is it not just picture postcard perfect? Built in the mid 12th century from Kentish ragstone, however, only the tower is truly original, although the spire was added in the mid 15th century. The rest of the church expanded in the 13th century to cope with the increasing population. On stepping inside, the first thing that caught our attention was the wooden vaulted ceiling that runs the whole length of the nave. At the tower end, a recent addition is the 1990 church organ. The next thing we noticed was the box pews, a throwback to a bygone era. You may also notice the memorial plaque to Edith Nesbitt, author of the Railway Children and other children's books inside. She lived her last few years in the village and is buried in the graveyard. In the church porch you'll notice her original headstone made by her second husband Thomas Tucker. A replica marks the spot of her grave. On our obligatory walk around the graveyard, I spot the Commonwealth War Grave of J.W. Sullivan of the Merchant Navy, proving war touches the remotest of places. It's now just a tiny hop to Old Romney, our next destination, under three miles away. We have arrived at St Clement's, the parish church of Old Romney. This area was once an island in Roman times and then a port in Anglo-Saxon times. The current church dates from the Norman period, but when you step inside, you're in for a surprise. St Clement's featured in the 1963 movie The Scarecrow of Romney Marsh, based on Russell Thorndike's Dr Sin character. The movie repainted the box pews in the shade of pink you now find them in. This is still an active place of worship, retaining many ancient features, and then those 18th century editions of the gallery and the box pews. And if there's a gallery, then we need to climb it to get the best views. From here you get to look from the beautiful wooden vaulted ceiling down inside those box pews. You then notice not everyone faced the preacher. In those times, listening to the sermon was more important than seeing it. 
Stepping outside, we find another Commonwealth War Grave. This one, the last resting place of W.J. Stephen. And then some more unusual ones. But we're looking for the grave of Derek Jarman, artist, filmmaker and gay rights activist. He spent some of his final years living at Prospect Cottage at Dungeness, a few miles away. And now time to head on to the other Romney. New Romney, again just a couple of miles away. Now time for a confession. We took a look at New Romney in the other Romney Marsh road trip. So we drove to New Romney this time, but we didn't stop. And we certainly didn't go inside. I guess I need to sit on the naughty step. But we can still show you the outside of the church and I can give you a few facts. So heading into town I need to turn right. Car parking will be at the Church Road car park. Once you head off the high street you should be able to see St Nicholas's church. Once again Norman, built in the 12th century, a mixture of carnstone and Kentish ragstone. The carnstone would have been carved in France and shipped across to England to be included in the building of these churches. If you look carefully you'll notice you step down into the church. That's because the great storm of 1287 deposited so much shale and silt it changed the landscape forever, even diverting the course of the river Rother and changing the fortunes of New Romney which was no longer a port town. It's hard to imagine that this church once stood at the harbour side. We are now about a mile and a half from the sea. We're now heading towards our next destination of Lyd. Although I seem to be a little confused as to where I'm going. Still, we get another look at St Nicholas's. OK, back on the road again and it's another short hop to Lyd. You may have noticed there are not a lot of railway stations around. And even as we cross a railway line, this only supplies Dungeness Power Station. And now as we close in on Lyd, we get our first glimpse of All Saints. Known as the Cathedral of the Marsh, and we'll soon see why. Lyd is the most southern Kent town, and it's part of the Sank Ports Confederation as a limb of New Romney. I'll give you a little more detail about that shortly, but let's find somewhere to park and discover All Saints. What you see is a church built in the 15th century, but there has been a place of worship here for over 1500 years. You'll notice its entrance has two oak doors, usually a sign of a cathedral, and only a handful of churches in England have two. Once inside, the size will take you away, as well as that beautifully vaulted ceiling. And in the northwest corner, incorporated into its fabric, are the remains of a 4th or 5th century Romano British basilica. Lid, and particularly All Saints, suffered severely during World War II, and extensive damage was caused to the east end of the chancel. It took a direct hit on the 15th of October 1940. Funds were raised to painstakingly rebuild the church and it reopened again in January 1953. Lid is a relatively small remote town in the southwest of Kent. So why is such a large church? Well let's talk and drive. Remember the changing landscape of the Romney Marshes and that Sankport confederation I mentioned? Well Lid was a boom town. The Sankports, as in the French for five, created areas of reduced taxation that would support the Crown's naval aspirations. Anyway, as we head further west, the fenced off area to our left is the Ministry of Defence's Lid Camp. We're heading to our final church in this part and into East Sussex. We'll be passing the beautiful, historic, quaint town of Rye, which gave me a thought. For this route, why not consider Rye as a start and finish? May I recommend the incredibly charming Mermaid Inn? Historic with real old world charm and a team that creates something special. They have EV charging points in their guest car park, so just a little bit of forward thinking too. There'll be a link in the description. 
The other side of those sea defences is the golden beach of Camper Sands, one for another time. I hope you like what we put together here. If you have, then give us a like, it really helps us and we'd appreciate it. And why not subscribe? Who knows where we'll visit on our travels. So our final church in this part is St Mary in East Guildford and I'm going to be honest, I struggle to find it and where to park. But with a little careful editing, I hope I can guide you here. You see, it doesn't have an impressive tower like All Saints in Lyd or St Nicholas's in New Romney and I wouldn't say it's particularly well signposted. Nor is East Guildford that big. It's on our right here. The signpost is to our left. What do you think? And that in front of us is St Mary's. So this church is brick built and was consecrated in 1505. It's the only one of the 14 that's not in Kent. Inside you have box pews again and strangely it seems much smaller inside than the outside. Look out for the 19th century painted frieze of angels illustrating the six days of creation. It's amazing that this is 500 years old and at this point it's time to draw a close to part one of our look at Romney Marty's historic churches. Thanks so much for watching, hope to see you for part two. Stay safe, stay well and happy travels.